Well, Roger, we've talked about how in the early days you started thinking about cosmology when people really knew absolutely nothing about <laughs> cosmology at all. There was hardly anything about the stars that people would see. Now it's completely different. There's absolutely, mm. absolutely gigantic amounts of data yeah. and huge numbers of people pouring over them in every way. Uh, how, but you, I think, would feel that some quite fundamental things haven't really been answered at all. I mean, the role of the cosmological constant and then the, the origin of the... Uh, well, yes. tell me how you think <laughs> things stand at the moment. Well, I do. I suppose I must think about things somewhat differently because the problems that I've regarded as important uh, over the years attain scant attention these days. Well, I've always been very puzzled by the second law of thermodynamics and the, and the direction of time and all that. And whether well, there are various things it has to do with, which maybe are offshoots in one way or another, like how one conscious perception relates to it. But let's leave that aside for the moment. The main thing, which is a pretty obvious thing in a way, but which is almost totally ignored. Now, you see, we're supposed to have this Big Bang origin of the universe. And if, if entropy, which is this measure of disorder, is increasing with time, which is what the second law tells us, that means, well, okay, it's understandable if I have a glass of water and I splash it, it goes on the ground and you don't see the opposite. That's entropy increasing, you don't see the entropy decreasing. But if you state this the other way around, it's the same statement, but just phrased in the opposite direction, it means as you go back in time, things get more and more and more ordered. Entropy goes down and down and down. And where do you get? Well, you get to this thing called the Big Bang. And what's the best piece of evidence for the Big Bang? Well, it's this microwave background. You see this radiation coming from all directions. And this microwave background has one very important characteristic feature, as noticed very early on by the COBE uh, mission, that you see thermal equilibrium. You see this beautiful spectrum, the Planck spectrum, which indicates that what you're looking at was in thermal equilibrium. Well, it's not equilibrium really because it was expanding, but taking that into account, that expansion is not an entropy increasing expansion, it's adiabatic expansion. And Tolman, the American cosmologist and physicist, fully appreciated that. But you were looking at something which was in effect thermal equilibrium. Now that is, on the face of it, a paradox because surely when you go back in time, if the entropy is going down and down and down, it ought to be pretty small. Yet what you see is something telling you the entropy was at its maximum. Now, it's never been said, as you know, this is a great puzzle. Who says that? Well, I've been saying it, but <laughs> <laughs> hardly anybody else. Not only that, that they don't say that, but they say this is what you expect. In the standard cosmological models, if you take a completely random initial state, you, that's what you get, and that's what you expect. And yeah, sure. And that, you know, when they saw, when Penzias and Wilson saw this thing, um, Dickey and people would say, well, yeah, well, that's what we expected to see. <laughs> um, it's just the flash of the Big Bang you're seeing. Well, what about the entropy? <laughs> How can that be? Well, the, 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 I think there's a sort of irony here, because people tried to solve the Einstein equations for cosmology. And how do you solve them? Well, you assume symmetry, because otherwise the equations are just too hard to solve. And Friedman did this. He just assumed you have a very homogeneous isotropic universe, and now he was able to solve the equations. Einstein was rather unhappy with his equations <laughs> initially, but nevertheless, he did it right. Einstein agreed with his mathematics, but he thought, he thought there must be something wrong somewhere. But it's, Curious that, that it's these models which have been what people have used ever since. And since they use them, it's just, they think this is cosmology. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this is such an incredible assumption, mm -hmm. it doesn't sort of hit people. 
And this is where the entropy is low. It's because all the ripples in the space-time that could have been there weren't there. And they were initially assumed not to be there because it's the only way they could solve the equations. But then you get used to the idea they're not there because those are the models. But why weren't they there? All these degrees of freedoms in the gravitational free field could have been there. And to see how extraordinary this uh, assumption is, you think of a collapsing universe, which has all the ir irregularities which might be there, forms black holes, these black holes congeal, the entropy goes soaring up incredibly. Now that we have this Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy in a black hole, we now can make an estimate for how big that entropy is and how improbable the universe that we actually find ourselves to be in. So I can see you might have had that, that puzzle even before the big um, and microwave background was discovered because yes. that was attracted you to the, to the Hoyle steady-state model as a way of getting out of the Freeman It's uh, true that, that I thought about the... Yeah. You see, I did think about the second law issue very much in mm. connection with the, the, uh, the steady-state model. But there, yeah, it, it was something that I worried mm. about. But then it seemed that the problem could be solved with the picture that they have, with the hydrogen being uniformly distributed. Mm. And then as it plumps into stars, that gives you an increase in the entropy. It's, it's the right idea, because, but it's with the wrong model. You see, you have a model with the hydrogen produced uniformly, and as it clumps, it produces these hot spots. It's gra the action of gravity. Yeah. Gravity produces hot spots, and the sun is a hot spot in the dark sky, and it's not that the sun is, is hot, not the sun is bright, gives us our uh, life on the Earth, because if the whole, the whole sky was the same temperature as the sun, it would be totally useless. It's the combination of the hot sun and the dark sky, and that's where the low entropy resides, and that comes about through gravity. So it was this crucial thing, which, yeah, already when yes, I was thinking about steady state, I must have been thinking about that, although I can't quite pinpoint that. But that's true. I did, I did yes. worry about s second law then. But the fact that the hydrogen was... Did Dennis Sharma think about that at all? Because that's the sort of thing which... I don't remember that, particularly. Yeah. Yes, he yeah. should have. But, well, I wrote this article for the, the Hawking... No, not for the, well, Hawking Israel with the editors, the Einstein centenary volume. Yeah. And um, this was... I put this long article about the, study, about the second law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. I don't think I had discussed all those things with Dennis beforehand. But, but I didn't have the particular idea that I had subsequently then. Yes, yes. yes yeah. I didn't know how to characterize the particular way in which the Big Bang was special. And that really comes out of studying the conformal structure. I mean, that's, that's one thing. That's yes, that you, you, yes. You, in the earlier days, you wouldn't have I think attached I had, as much yes. importance to as you, as you yes. would subsequently. Well, there were a number of things I noticed very early on, which played very important roles later on, but I couldn't figure out early. See, one of them is this fact, just, just a curious fact in mathematics. We're talking about four dimensions, and we're talking about space-time, for one time, three space, and we're talking about the vial curvature. Now, the vial curvature is a conformal curvature, so if you have a metric, you don't know what the scale of things is, but you know what angles are, or if you know what the light cones are, that's another way of saying the same thing. That conformal structure tells you where the light cones are, but you don't know big from small. Then the characterization of the curvature is in this vial curvature, W-E-Y-L. Um, and the vial curvature is a measure of the conformal curvature. But it's also, in a sense, a measure of the gravitational degrees of freedom. Now, in connection with twisters, but not specifically twisters, I think I was thinking about it before that, because I was looking at how you write in spinners the zero rest mass field equations for all the different spins. It was basically Dirac, and though I had it, although when he did the zero mass case, for some reason he did it a different way, which I never fully understood. Mm. But if you followed up Dirac's earlier paper and did it for zero mass, that's what you get. You have this particular way of writing the, the different spins. And the Maxwell equations, you've just got two indices, and then you the, the graviton equation, if you like, you've got four indices. It's just the same equation. Neutrino equation is just one, if you can consider it massless. And so the, the gravitational field is to propagate, and there's this wave equation. I had this interesting 
sort of like slightly anecdotal things. Dirac never talked much, but I was a fellow at St. John's College at the same time as Dirac, and I remember at one point asking him whether I could have a chat with him about some of his stuff, you see, because I knew he was interested in quantizing general relativity. And so he, he agreed, and so he went off and had this, and I started describing this spinner stuff to him. And I had this equation, this wave equation for the, for the, for the uh, spin two field, you see. And I said, I wondered if this might have anything to do with quantization. You Using see. the two spinners which he had introduced. Which he did, he introduced, you, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, he introduced, yeah. Well, he didn't introduce the idea. Well, no, no, but he yeah, introduced to, me, to you. Yeah. Absolutely, that's right. And so he, sa well, he said, I, why is this any use of quantization? Well, I don't know. You have to have a Hamiltonian with this comment. So, mm. so I was slightly. But then the other thing, yes, the other thing about this equation, he said, well, where does that case, he said to me, where does that equation come from? I said, well, it comes from the Bianchi identities. And he said, what are the Bianchi identities? And I thought, what? Uh, you don't know what the Bianchi... You see, yeah. and here he'd been doing all these quantizations. Well, you see, he obviously knew them. He just didn't know they were called the Bianchi oh, identities. He knew the, contract, he, yeah. the contracted ones because of all... And it was curious that... I mean, I guess he, he... Somebody who worked very much on his own, too. So yeah. he knew all these equations, yeah. but he had no idea that they, those were called the Bianchi identities. That's a slight um, odd extra story. But the point was, this came later, but the realization that you had this propagation equation, mm. which made the, the gravitational equations look just like Maxwell equations, but for spin two rather than spin one. I mean, this was done already by Pauli and Fiertz or something, but they didn't do it this way. They did it in a much more complicated looking way. But if you write it in two spinners, it becomes completely obvious. But then I started worrying about the conformal invariance of these equations. And it, I was just struck by this curious fact that that equation is conformally invariant with a particular weighting, conformal weighting for the spinner. And we already have the interpretation of the vial curvature as being uh, the conformal curvature. And therefore, it has a, another conformal interpretation. So it's a conformal object. But the weighting is different. Mm. You have two different conformal weightings. And it just struck me, struck me there's something important here. And I had no idea what it was. <laughs> well, so it was only much, much later when I realized it is absolutely crucial in a certain way, which comes to this leap ahead. Yes, cosmology now, now coming on to your yes. most recent. Well, you were asking me about, about the, the well, about second law and, and what I thought was important. And yeah. this big problem, you see, for a long, long time, I just thought, like everybody else, that the Big Bang, to understand it, we need quantum gravity. I mean, that's the, that's the conventional view. We need quantum gravity. Maybe it's string theory quantum gravity. Maybe it's loop quantum gravity. Maybe it's this kind of quantum gravity or the other kind of quantum gravity or a twist of quantum gravity. But it's quantum gravity. Now, that means to me, or meant to me, quantum gravity must be a jolly funny theory because the singularity, you see, one of the reasons you're studying quantum gravity is to explain the Big Bang singularity. Where do you all see, all see other singularities? Black holes. They're utterly, completely different. People used to say, well, you know, you've got singularities in the black holes. Doesn't that tell you you've got singularities in the Big Bang? You've got singularities in the Big Bang, therefore in the black holes. Just the same thing, time's going the other way around. But it's not. <laughs> They're utterly different. But it's this entropy thing. Mm -hmm. The singularities in black holes are absolutely wild. The curvature, vile curvature goes completely dominates, wilds, oscillates all over the place. Complete, complete madness. In the Big Bang, calm as you could imagine. Think of the Big Bang as a great violent thing, but it's, <laughs> but it's utterly regular. Gravitational degrees of freedom simply not activated. Now, what kind of quantum gravity is going to give you these two utterly different extremes in the black hole, complete domination by the vial curvature? In the Big Bang, vial curvature seems to be zero, or at least very, very suppressed. Uh, OK, my view then was to say, oh, well, quantum gravity must be a jolly funny theory with the time, uh, not time asymmetric. And if we're going to find quantum gravity theory, you've got to put in time asymmetry somewhere, you see. So that was my view until, well, I guess 
uh, about eight or nine years, I forget how long ago now it was, um, eight or nine years ago. I just had this idea, I was thinking about, uh, well, it took me a long time to be persuaded, when I say a long time, maybe about three years, to be persuaded that the observations of these distant supernovae made by Perlmutter, Perlmutter and Schmidt and, and uh, Rees had, had um, convincingly showed that their universe is accelerating in its expansion. And they, it was all sort of touted as being this totally mysterious thing that nobody could understand, totally unexpected. Yes. And I should say, well, go and look at all, all the yes, cosmology I books. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmological constant. Yeah. It's in all the cosmology books. I don't know why they thought it was mysterious. Why it should... I think we should explain. We're talking about yeah. dark, dark, dark energy, energy that's uh, right, which dark we think energy. is neither dark nor, nor energy. Nor indeed. energy. It's yeah. a very bad name, very bad name. But nevertheless, that's what people call it. And it's, it's there, apparently. Fits in absolutely perfectly, as far as we know now, with what it, the term Einstein introduced in 1917 for admittedly the wrong reason. I mean, he wanted a static universe. Well, half of it's right, and it's the only, yeah. it's the only modification you can make that's generally co covalent. Absolutely, I mean, that's, yes. That's, it's not that's just right. a term. It's, it's not just a term. It is the one thing you can do to general relativity without wrecking it, yeah. basically. Yes. Without changing it in a ra radical way. That's right. And so often I would take it into consideration in asymptotics, the work I did in trying to look at radio, uh, squashing infinity down yes. and making infinity look like a finite boundary. And you can use the conformal invariance of Maxwell's equations or of, the, of this equation that you get for yeah. the propagation of gravitons, if you like. It tells you what, how to study radiation field by looking at infinity. And I also knew that if there was a cosmological constant which was positive, this surface would be space-like. It would be null if it's null, zero cosmological constant, time light if it's negative cosmological constant. Fortunately, it's not negative because that causes all sorts of problems, <laughs> even though the string theorists seem to like it. Um, <coughs> the positive cosmological constant is a completely different class of problems. I used to think it had bad features. On reflection, it seemed to me they were just unusual features. But now it was absolutely crucial, mm. because I was thinking about the very remote future and how boring it was going to be in the very remote future. All the black holes eventually disappear by Hawking evaporation, and there's nothing left of any interest, and this goes on to eternity. But to me, eternity is not such a long time, because I'm used to thinking of compressing it down by these conformal scalings. This is what I mean by <laughs> defe defeating time in more than one way, Roger. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, the argument was basically... <laughs> I mean, I tend to use this in lectures as a sort of joke. <laughs> but it's a real argument, you know, that the universe gets so incredibly boring but there won't be anybody of us, any of us around to be bored by it. Mainly it's photons, and you can't very bore photons very easily. And so photons just go straight into this boundary. And the picture I was having and getting very used to was the idea of a boundary, which you, if you've just got masses things, that boundary is like anywhere else. And then the thought occurred to me, well, you've got a space-like boundary for the Big Bang. Why don't you put them together? So it's an outrageous thought. And I gave lectures on this, usually being careful to call it an outrageous idea before anybody else said it was outrageous. <laughs> but uh, as the years went by, I began to think more. Well, I, I think originally I would have given it a, a reasonable chance of being right. Reasonable chance, maybe not 50%. There's more substance, isn't there, through Paul Todd's work? And the this, well, you see, yeah. Paul Todd, yeah. yes. See, Paul Todd. I had the thing I called the viral curvature hypothesis, which was to say that the viral curvature, as just a hypothesis, a way of characterizing the, the, the Big Bang, that it, as you have an initial type singularity like the Big Bang, the viral curvature should be zero. But that's awkward to say because it's a singular state. What do you mean by a tensor when it's singular and so on? So Paul had a much neater way of expressing it, which was to say you stretch it out, it's stretch out the Big Bang by a conformal factor, which is something we did all the time for yes. the Friedman models. That was quite a yeah. standard thing. But to make that the condition on the Big Bang, I think, is, is an important step. 
as Paul has originally, it only makes the vowel curvature finite, doesn't necessarily zero. But as I already knew, the infinity, the vowel curvature must be zero because of the way these things scale, as I said before. Mm. Because there's a conformal factor in the scaling, it must scale the vowel curvature to zero. So if you stick them together, the zero vowel curvature must propagate through to be zero on the next eon. So I started playing around with these ideas. Half thinking it was completely crazy, I suppose, and half thinking it's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> and we end up with looking for circles in the sky, yes, which yes. is absolutely, actually something we can actually see, something to do it's with the Mobius transformations on the sphere. What, oh, could, well be that's what could be more beautiful it's, as it's a, a prediction? It's <laughs> well, you see, I was beginning... I, this didn't occur immediately. I, I was trying, people would ask me about, you know, how could you tell if this is right? And I thought sort of rather wrongly about gravitational radiation or something. But it was later that it occurred to me, what's the most violent thing that could happen that we, might be a signal getting through? And so I was thinking of these <coughs> collisions between supermassive black holes. You see, we're on a collision course with Andromeda, the Andromeda Nebula, and it has a black hole, which is, I forget, 20, 50 times bigger than ours. And uh, we have a, a four million solar mass black hole, and it's got a bigger one. And they could, on our collision course, they might well capture each other, spiral around, boom. When they swallow each other up, there'll be one huge explosion in the form almost entirely of gravitational waves. Now these gravitational waves, as I'm used to, you've got the boundary, they will come and they'll hit the boundary in a definite place. What will they do when they get through? Well, because of the scalings, they can't exist as gravitational waves on the other side. They have to scale down into another form. And the equations tell us that you have to have a new dark, now again, the word dark isn't a very good one, but I think on, on the conformal cyclic cosmology scheme, which is what I'm talking about here, Simply, uh, acronym or what do you call it, CCC, uh, is this scheme tells us that the gravitation, the information in the gravitational waves propagates across, but in the form of disturbances in this initial ma dark matter. So you have dark material created and it will be given a kick by this gravitational wave impulse. So in fact, you have another prediction apart from the, the circular features corresponding to the no, these yeah, outgoing these curves of the, yes, uh, yes. the gravitational radiation, and you have a prediction for what dark matter will turn out to yes, be, which is quite different. That is from true. What people are looking it for in different. nice shots. And, and I haven't that, shouted yeah. about that one yes. particularly because, yeah. I mean, it's it's I, what I call the initial form of dark matter because it's massless originally. Mm -hmm. It has to be massless, but the equations also tell you that you have to grow mass, so that you can't keep massless. They're just an inconsistency. So the mass has to occur. It it's must be tied in with Higgs mechanisms and so on. It, it hasn't been as yet properly. But I think one has to understand more about particle physics. How does the Higgs mechanism, new the creation of mass in the early universe, relate to the appearance of mass, which comes in from the equations that you have here? This is another huge area of your thought, really, is how yeah. conformal symmetry is broken yes. and there's different yes, ways yes. in which it's broken, which we yes. see much more clearly by expressing things in twisted geometric terms. So yes. you see the breaking explicitly, but there are yes. all these different aspects to it. Uh, I've always been in two minds about yeah. that, yes. I suppose the cosmological constant has changed a bit because I used to think mm -hmm. one of my minds was that you have the... If there's no cosmological constant, you have this sort of Poincaré group twisters and that's you have a sort of exact sequence and the exact sequences play a big role in a lot of cohomology and twister theory and so on but if you have a cosmological constant you don't quite have an exact mm -hmm. sequence you have mm -hmm. something which is invertible and it changes one's attitude so I think that was a shift the cosmological constant took me a little while to get used to but with the cosmology it comes absolutely crucial yes. you can't you can't do this cosmology without a cosmological constant so you must have dark energy, as it's called, and you must have dark matter, as it's called, because there has to be a new created this scalar material every time you go from one eon to the next. And so therefore, in order that it is not to pile up, it's got to decay away too. 
So it must, throughout the history of each eon, the dark matter f decays away, which I believe there is some rather feeble evidence for. I don't know how much to trust it. I see, it must decay rather than clump together, which uh, yes. is, is, is well, otherwise... It, black it, well, it could for a bit, but then it must eventually decay. It right? must decay. Yeah. yeah, otherwise it will build up. Yes. And then it'll just build up from eon to eon, yeah. and then you won't have, have a way of propagating. So I think it's got to decay. But there are some... Uh, it's not The evidence is not very strong, but I heard two bits of evidence. One was from a lecture given by Stephen Weinberg when he seemed to suggest that the density... the, the proportion of dark matter was larger in the very early universe than it is now. Uh -huh. The other thing I picked up on, now none of these thi neither of these things may be right, but I just picked up on them because they <laughs> sort of fitted in with what I was thinking. The other one was there are observations of, of pair annihilation, I think, in, in the region near the center, well, of positrons, I think that's what it is, but you see positrons or something in the region near the center of the, of the are galaxy. Are they with these decay products? Uh, I think there is a view, it may not, yeah. uh, there may be lots of views, that it may be a, a decay product of, of dark matter. I have no idea. So no, not yeah. directly into photons, they would go through? Imagine. They go through, a, yeah, not photons, but some, yeah. I, I don't have strong views on that, but, it, but it, would, it would have to go eventually, yeah. So dark matter, yes. But then the other thing, there's a more recent thing too. <laughs> it's... It, it may explain lots of things, you see. Of course, lots of that's all the better because there may be things that could contradict it, and if there are things that can contradict it, as Bondi used to say with the steady state model, yes. the beauty of the steady state <laughs> model was that, is that it could be contradicted, and of course it was. Oh, yes. <laughs> so one has to look out for these things. But there is this uh, um, information which was released um, <coughs> in March of this year, 2014, about these what are called bicep two observations, where the claim is, or was, has been, that this is the smoking gun of inflation. I haven't said anything about inflation, but I should say that in this model of mine, CCC, inflation can't be there. It would spoil things. Inflation is supposed to have been this exponential expansion which is supposed to have taken place in the very, very early stages of the universe. Initially, the reasons put forward were ones that I always thought were just incorrect, having to do with the uniformity of the universe. And that only works if you've got a uniformity there or or originally. It doesn't. You can see from general arguments that can't be an argument. There are good reasons, though, that kept inflation going one of them being the scale invariance of the fluctuations in temperatures that you see in the microwave background. And if you don't have inflation, you need another explanation. So to me, in a sense, there was inflation. That was the exponential expansion of the eon prior to ours, which is similar to an idea that Veneziano put forward some years before this scheme of mine. So uh, it's not a bad idea. But there are now much stronger constraints on what the inflationary, I mean, for people who in yes. for inflation is on what they can viably... Well, it, it the B modes that they claim to see, these are polarization, mm. uh, uh, photon polarizations that are seen, probably do are correctly seen in, in the early universe. But the conclusion that is made is that you see these things which couldn't arise from purely magnetic for features. They have to be, sorry, purely electric. They have to be magnetic. Uh, how they, you get curls, which you couldn't have if it was purely electric. Now, Paul Todd was talking to me earlier this year about um, uh, problems that there were about the creation of primordial magnetic fields, and there are difficulties in ordinary cosmology about where they come from. You apparently see them in magnetic fields in these voids, regions where there are no galaxies. What and how on earth did the magnetic fields come about? And the view seems to be that they must have been there right from the Big Bang. Mm. And those would produce B-modes. Mm. So the idea is not just that the B-modes that claim are claimed to be the smoking gun of inflation are nothing of the sort, but are primordial magnetic fields. And that those magnetic fields, according to the suggestion that Paul made to me, is that maybe they came through from the previous eon, which they would on this scheme because they'd be attached to galactic clusters and those little places where the galactic cluster 
impinges on the crossover surface, you will have magnetic fields. And then there was just very recently, um, I, I was hearing about these things, you see, and was very rather alarmed by the BMOs and the fact that this seemed to be proving inflation, so everybody said, since that would disprove CCC. <laughs> you see, inflation can't coexist with it for various reasons. So uh, I began thinking, well, maybe these are the things Paul's claiming should be there. And then I um, emailed my colleague, Varhe Gerzajan, who had uh, been the person initially who'd, who had seen the evidence of these circular features, concentric circular features, because these would be each time there's a, an, a black hole collision in a galactic cluster, there would be boom, you see, that's one ring. A little bit later, another one, boom, there's another ring. And these would always be concentric because the central point is where that galactic cluster ends up as. So he was looking for, looking at at least three rings where the variance, the variation of temperature around the ring is lower by a certain amount than the average. And this was the test we were using to, for these things. And he claims to see lots of indications of these things, very non-isotropic over the sky. Certain regions were huge numbers of them, other regions were practically nothing. So when I heard about the B modes, I said, well, uh, I emailed Vahe, I said, yeah. where is this region they're seeing these things? Can you pinpoint it on the sky? So he put a little ring and said, it's in here. And this was in, in his Planck map. So this was the recent, more recent, the old ones were the W map ones that he looked at, the Planck map ones, and I looked at his picture, Nothing whatsoever in there. So I thought, oh dear. <laughs> so I looked back at the older W map ones, the same place, and bang, there was a triple of rings right in the middle. So then I emailed Vahe and I said, well, um, why don't I see them in the Planck data? So he said, oh, well, I'll turn up the volume a bit. <laughs> Didn't say it quite like that. Looking at slightly lower signals, and there, there they are, absolutely right in the middle. Moreover, Moreover, if these are Paul Todd's, uh, well, if, if the BMOs really are magnetic fields, and if these rings are really from that galactic cluster in the previous eon, it's only just on the edge, just from the geometry. It has to be where our past light cone hits where the galactic cluster ends up. And therefore, the temperature of these rings must be average. See, the, the distant ones, the signal's coming towards us and therefore warmer. The close ones are signals going away from us and therefore cooler. The ones which are just on the edge would be of average temperature. I look at these rings, they're right. The color coding is green, which means right in the middle. So this is sort of exciting. Yes, that is. Yeah. If this is right, when we could make prediction, well, we make the predictions anyway, but <laughs> we'll see what the... Because the Planck data hasn't come up out yet on this. And so it looks as though we might make a prediction of the sorts of places to look for where you should see B modes. Because those, in, if that's right, see this is a second observational feature of, of the scheme. But nobody pays any attention to the first one yet. <laughs> it's been almost completely ignored. I mean there were uh, exciting verifications of this that we had last of September. Yes, the, yeah. Well, well um, Christoph Meisner gave a very yeah. nice talk where he yeah. explained his analysis, which is quite different from, from, yeah. from Vahe Gurzajan's analysis. And he also saw significant I evidence for these rings. Yes. Know, yes. Looked at in a different way, but yeah. yes, it's the same, the same feature. But again, or no, no attention paid. <laughs> uh, some, on some that a different subject of predictions. Where how do you think things stand on the evidence for quantum mechanical dependence of biological structure yeah. in the brain? I mean, this is something well, also you've There have been some interesting yeah. things in, in recent years, yes. Um, well, you see, first, I should explain that, you see, I wrote my book, The Emperor's New Mind, hoping that by the time I got to the end of the book, I would have some inkling of <laughs> how quantum effects could be relevant to action of brain, and I couldn't. There mm. was, it wasn't, I, it kind of petered out there. But it did have the advantage, I mean, I thought maybe I would inspire young people to do physics or something. 
uh, it was more either ancient retired people who wrote <laughs> to me or else it was somebody in other scientific subjects. And one of these was Stuart Hameroff, who did read my book. And he said, well, look, you may not know about these things called microtubules. It's just showing my ignorance. I never heard of them at that time. These are the things that in mitosis, when a cell divides, you see the chromosomes being pulled apart and these microtubules are dragging them apart. They play all sorts of roles in cells generally, but they seem to have a particular role, according to Stuart anyway, Stuart Hameroff, that they play a particular role in consciousness in the brain. And his business, professional activity, is putting people to sleep as an anesthesiologist in Arizona. <coughs> and so, unlike maybe many of his colleagues who are just interested in putting people to sleep, he's sort of interested in actually what he's doing when he's putting people to sleep. So, and his idea has been, and he tells me that there is now some good evidence that this is the case, that general anesthetics do act on directly on microtubules. So these are little nanoscale tubes, which are in, in all sorts of, almost all cells in the body um, and in neurons. But the argument is that they have a different role in neurons um, and that they play a central role in consciousness. Something very interesting has come up on, well, several things. One is some observation about where you can track where the consciousness kind of appears, what part of the brain is involved. And one thing that always worried me for a long time about most explanations of consciousness in terms of computation or something is why is the cerebellum not conscious? It seems to be entirely unconscious. Yet there are about half as many neurons as in the brain and far more connections between neurons in the cerebellum than in the mm. cerebrum. Yet the cerebrum seems to be where consciousness comes about. Well, these new observations have to do with these things called pyramidal cells. Pyramidal cells. I don't know how quite pronounced exactly. Pyramidal cells, which are particularly, they're sort of cells which look like pyramids, I suppose. But they don't occur in the cerebellum at all. They occur in a certain part of the brain, which is now identified as a, as a major part where consciousness does come about. And they are absolutely packed with microtubules, apparently. So this is an int one interesting development. It's, it sort of sh alters the picture somewhat. But I've always been worried by why the cerebellum, with all these connections and so on, why isn't that indicate, why is that unconscious? But it seems to be it doesn't have these particular types of cells. And that may be a crucial thing. But the other important development has to do with the experimental findings of um, um, Anaben Bandiapadhyay, who has been doing experiments largely in Japan with colleagues. He's an Indian doing experiments there. And on individual microtubules, where they measure the resistance with particular frequencies, he finds that there are very particular frequencies where the thing becomes extremely conductive hmm. in ways which are quite unlike classical conduction. Um, you see, I had the complicated roundabout route for thinking that quantum mechanics has to be playing a role, and not just quantum mechanics, but beyond quantum mechanics. You see, it's not just outrageous, because people used to think, oh, well, brain is all wet and messy, and how can you have coherent quantum mechanics going on there? Uh, but I'd say not only that, it's got to be at the level, extended to the level where you start to see divergence from standard quantum mm -hmm. mechanics. Now, that's totally out outrageous, you see. But my reasoning came from the Gödel things mm -hmm. and saying, well, it really seems that uh, um, our understanding cannot be something of a purely computational character. And it's very interesting because, of course, with Turing, <laughs> It seemed that in his early years, he was very... I think he would have been very alive to these yes, questions yes, and much yes. more than people who followed I can, I can uh, imagine his computational yes. model uh, yes. as a dog. I mean, as a... Because yeah. he wrote this paper on ordinal logics, uh, which was trying to, you know, going beyond systems and... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yes. di very difficult to tell. I mean, I think the success of computational methods during the war really got him going I think to explore how true. much you could go yes, in yeah. that direction. But he was certainly worried about the... The yeah, fact that yeah. physics is actually quantum mechanical. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, he was yeah, alive yeah, to that in a way that yeah. other people not exposed That's to. Right. But then you see, normally one would think you could you could compute at least to any degree of accuracy, as a sort of argument yeah. that Turing himself would make, that what have what the Schrödinger equation does. But then in standard quantum mechanics, you then have to use the Schrödinger equation only as probabilistic 
but then you have to have a measurement. Well, he was very aware of the reduction. Yes, yes that's that right. Being, being ruled too. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, yeah. you got that directly yeah. from von Neumann. Von Neumann, that's right. Yes, too, yes. Which is probably also how you would yes, have approached no, it. Yes, also, that's right. Yes, I was right the first principle. aware of that very much. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So, uh, but what's interesting is that now, in biology, it's not just in these microtubules, because that's Bandia Padjahai's ob yeah. observations, which do seem to indicate something very strange is going on in microtubules, which certainly is not classical. And how you explain it quantum mechanically? Well, that's people don't even know how to explain high temperature superconductivity properly yet. So there's, there are lots of things to understand there. But now we know photosynthesis involves um, entanglements, quant essentially quantum mechanical effects. Some things about um, navig bird, bird navigation, is it? I think it is, yes, something. And sensitivity to magnetic field or something. These, these things do seem to tell us that there is a lot more going on in biology which you simply can't explain purely classically, apart from, apart from chemistry, which is already quantum mechanical. <laughs> but uh, you see, I'm saying you've got to have enough quantum mechanics that it's coherent across many neurons in a way which allows sufficient displacement of mass according to the scheme that I tried to develop with. Well, Dioshi originally had a scheme like this, and then for different, with different motivations, I picked up on an idea very similar, which is that when in superpositions, if there's a much enough mass displacement, then it goes over into a classical alternatives. But this is very frowned upon by most quantum mechanics people because they think that quantum mechanics has to hold invariably at all levels. But all experiments to date have only been at a level where you don't probe this re area. So there's experiments hiding in the wings there too. Well, thank you very much, Roger, for giving this time. Well, time again, has, uh, <laughs> time is dominating our Well, it's been a great pleasure for me. It's always a pleasure to talk about these things and try to rake up ideas. Ah, <laughs> and maybe inspire someone who's watching this to think. It would be nice. Yes, it would be really be nice. nice. Who knows? Yeah. Right.